Welcome. It's just gone 7 p.m. Wednesday, 22nd December, and you are watching episode 35 of Regional Wrap. Regional Wrap, providing an insight to the issues affecting regional Australia and giving a voice to regional residents. My name is Bill Bates. Joining, on, joining me on this episode, native title, an adhesive or a dividing wedge, is my guest, Yodi Batsky. Yodi was born on Thursday Island and is an active community and political advocate in far north Queensland. As a traditional owner from Cape York Peninsula, identifying with the Wapavi people of Shelbourne Bay, Cape York. Being a former member, <clears throat> former director of the Wapavi Aboriginal Corporation Prescribed Body Corporate and the Bro Bromley Aboriginal Corporation Prescribed Body Corporate, he has extensive experience with native title and land tenure processes and understands the associated legislative complexities confronting far north communities, irrespective of ethnicity. As a former regional council chairperson in ASIC, Yodi is fully conversant with the legislative requirements, obligations to the community and expectation of government statutory bodies. Mm. Yodi's extensive involvement <clears throat> with both in the public and private sectors spans more than 25 years in communities in far north Queensland, the Torres Straits, southeast Queensland, New South Wales and the ATC. As a small business owner for the past 14 years, Yodi has assisted various private sector organisations and public sector agencies in strategic planning, <clears throat> intercultural awareness, corporate governments, land tenure and community engagement. He's also had roles related to housing issues, land and sea rights, health and cultural heritage. Welcome, Yodi. Thank you, Bill. Well, let's look at the um, situation at the moment. Uh, Indigenous uh, affairs are, all, are always in the news. And over the last couple of years, we've been faced with the rising uh, activities and influences from overseas with Black Lives Matter. Mm -hmm. um, have you noticed any sort of pick up in the, your communities in regards to um, basically what their expectations are in the future? Look, that, that, that's a good question. Um, and uh, I guess when you have a look at the landscape of, of Queensland and in particular uh, Cape York, Cape York Peninsula or far north Queensland and the Torres Straits, anyone that understands the north know that uh, we have quite a few Indigenous communities. And as a result of that, uh, anyone can look it up on, on any, uh, any website to look at the actual demographics and the region, what the region's about. We, we actually, a region that contains a very high percentage of of, uh, of welfare. You know, it's sad to know that far north Queensland is not known for its natural resources and mining and, and other things that have been very active in Cape York. We're known for our, our welfare system, uh, our health system, our unemployment, our uh, CDP programs. So in, in saying that, as far as what has changed, what hasn't changed, COVID has changed everything. COVID has changed how our Indigenous community interact with each other, how families interact with each other, and it's no different with the non-Indigenous communities. But uh, this year I had spent some time in the Torres Straits with uh, another commitment that I do with, uh, with an Indigenous uh, Bible college, and I'm no longer a part of that. But this one community that I, I had visited um, this year, I was informed by locals that uh, the government through their job networking providers or the job networking agencies um, basically said to participants who were involved with CDP that they didn't have to report or do anything, that the government would just pay their benefits until 2023. And no one knew about that. So what I'm saying is that what's actually changed? Nothing much other than our government 
once again perpetuating a welfare mentality in our region and I'm not backward and coming forward about that I, I I'm against the uh, the welfare the slave mentality that's perpetuated uh, in our communities by government policy and I can see it here in Cairns in far north Queensland we have a very very high unemployment rate uh, of both Indigenous and non-Indigenous so what's actually changed since um, Black Lives Matters and other things, nothing much other than a community that is going backwards in many areas. You look around us, our crime rate is high, our suicide rate is high, domestic violence is up. So current pandemic has actually changed a lot of things in the landscape. And if not, it's actually uh, caused a lot of social issues to increase. So just just, in, just finish up on what Black Lives Matter, do, do you think it's more of something that has been picked up by individuals in the white community to drum up sort of some narrative, basically, uh, rather than Indigenous people you know, grabbing onto it sort of thing? It's, it's actually um, activists and things like that down south that are driving the conversation in these, these sort of things and not the Indigenous people themselves, especially in the communities. Look, I uh, I did not get involved in any of the, the marches here for the simple reason, and this is my personal choice, and I was crucified for saying this on my own Facebook page, but I firmly believe that all lives matters, irrespective of ethnicity, irrespective of postcode, socioeconomic background, and uh, I, I firmly believe that something that had not involved us at all, um, whoever were the ones that knew how to push the, you know, the buttons of, of those who wear their heart on the sleeves, both black and white, they milked it for everything it was worth. And, and um, you know, I, when I was open on my Facebook page and stating that, I actually had quite a few friends uh, block and delete me and I can't control their thoughts or views on me. But at that particular time, I firmly believe that um, we, we had failed to, to look at the, at the broader issues because if you look at it, all lives matters. And, and I was going on about, hey, suicide is still happening in our community. Crime is still happening in our community. Domestic violence is still happening in our community. Uh, abuse of our elders is still happening in the community. And that happens to both Black, White and Brindle. So my thoughts on that particular issue at that time was, is that for me, I am not going to just make it a Black thing. I firmly believe that my thoughts and views on it, and that was also shared by my husband, is, is that all lives should matter, irrespective of who we are and where we are. All right, we'll just move on now. Um, 2022 will be 30 years since the High Court handed down its decision on Mabo, mm -hmm. and uh, the government went on to establish the Native Titles Act. Yeah. So, so we've had... We're coming on up to three decades. So mm -hmm. most people, it's, people heard about it in general. Some people obviously understand it because they're involved. Um, but from the bulk of the population, uh, especially uh, down south, because uh, native title isn't such a big issue because um, as far as scope goes, whereas in Queensland, especially uh, northern Queensland, uh, so much what we call crown land that is available, available to get covered by um, the Native Title Act, whereas there has been, oh, in the southern states, there has been dis a disconnection of people with their land. So it's a little bit di more difficult there. Can you give us a bit of an idea, sort of, I think there's been uh, over 213 uh, wardings of Native Title um, and I think 54 rejections of native title that have You're gone talking about 54. here in Queensland? Here in Queensland? Uh, overall, yes, overall. Overall, yeah. Yeah, Australia. So yeah. can you give us a bit of a insight in regards to, A, how many claims sort of what claims are and scope of the claims in Queensland and a bit of the process? Look, um, I, I think 
the first thing that uh, people need to understand and 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 I might say that even at times indigenous people get get confused with the two processes because whoever is actually delivering the narrative of native title and the process from a federal level often do not explain that it is a commonwealth process that we're going through with native title. And so here in Queensland, I think we have about 120 determinations that have happened. And that includes the Torres Straits in that. And that is a, that is a federal government process as a result of, of the Mabo decision. But I'll go back. I've often said this to, to my elders that I had represented at the time on the Wutati Aboriginal Corporation, my, my immediate family, that the native title process that we have now is a totally different beast compared to what was determined back in 1992-93. It, it, it's not the same. Why is, is that our native title act at a commonwealth level is, it is often amended and changed every time there is a new direction or every time basically traditional owners have, you know, have, have identified something that's unique which is not reflective in the Native Title Act, and then bang, you know, we, we have a different, uh, an amendment to the Act. And I, I put it to you this way, with the number of years that I've been on our corporation prior to me stepping down as a director, once we had our Native Title determination given to us, um, I think it was about five or six years ago, four years ago. Prior to that, I had seen Nate, the landscape of native title change. The, the goalposts were continually being changed. And so a lot of the determinations that were, were finally awarded took, took many, many years. Wutati Aboriginal Corporation, by the time we were given our native title or acknowledgement of our native title rights to country, um, nearly, nearly 20 something years had passed. So as a federal government process, it doesn't happen overnight. It actually is a very, very long-winded process. And we've actually seen elders, not only in our own traditional owner group, but elders in other traditional owner groups who were the, the trailblazers in, in, in heading and spearheading those native title claims. Some of them have passed on. Hence the reason why here in Queensland, we have about 120 determinations. Now, this is what I'm trying to explain. It's, it's, it's it, it, in a simple layman term, native title is a federal government process. It acknowledges the native title rights of the traditional owners of a particular area before British sovereignty. So as part of that process to prove that they still have connection to land bill, we would have to do a, what they call a connection report as part of that registration of our, our, initial, our initial determination or application for a determination. So that means that those who are proving that they still have a connection to country will have to um, give evidence of language, give evidence of sites of significance, places of significance, rivers of significance, uh, stories, oral stories that have been passed down and knowledge that have been passed down from one generation to the other. So the native title process only acknowledges that we have a connection to the land, but it doesn't give us the land. Here in Queensland, we have another process, which is the, the land tenure process. And I've often said this to, to, uh, to community people that have asked me questions about this informally. I've actually said, look, Yes, you can be acknowledged for your native title rights to land, but that does not give you the land. It only acknowledges that you can go and hunt and gather. You can go and still conduct customary law and, and traditional practices, whether it be men's business, women's business, and that's L-O-R-E, not L-A-W. But if they're wanting to have that sense of ownership, a state land transfer by the Queensland government needs to be entered into. Now, um, I think it was about 2007, the government at that time, the Queensland government at that time had amended their Cape York Heritage Act and, and also the Torres Strait Islander Heritage Act, where part of that process, land had to be transferred back to traditional owners. 
and I'm talking about deed of grant and trust land in Cape York and Torres Straits. So the Queensland government had set up the, the Cape York Peninsula land tenure resolution process. And that actually basically worked side by side with a native title process. Some traditional owners were given land tenure before native title, but where the problem was within the land tenure process is that it would often interfere with the native title process. So you have two competing processes, one federal, one state. So what the, the, the land tenure resolution process in Queensland did here under the Queensland government was just, okay, we will use at that time, the Department of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Partnership, that's it. It now has a different name. And it includes, uh, I think, disability and science and, and uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Partnership. DATSIP was the organisation, the government organisation, that would then go out and do the land tenure consultation. And this is where they needed to engage Indigenous land councils to be a part of that processes. Here in North Queensland, we have uh, the Cape York Land Council. So the Cape York Land Council looked after as a registered native title body, the, the native title process, the Commonwealth. Then you had another organization, which was called Balkanu, that looked after the, the state land tenure process. So they went out and did all the consultation with the traditional owner groups of Cape York in relation to the transfer of land. So we actually had simultaneously, and I'm speaking from experience here, Wutati, I sat as a director here with our native title process. And it was a long arduous process of uh, making sure that the final determination, everyone was happy with it. And I'm talking about people who were respondents to that claim, such as the Cookshire Council, uh, any other pastoralists, anyone that had interest in that particular area, they were able to be respondents to that native title claim. So you have a native title process, a federal process and a state land dealing process, all, it's like two railway tracks, I often say, they're all simultaneously working. Why? Because the native title process identified the traditional owners that needed to be a part of the state land dealing process. So basically the state allowed a federal process to do all of the hard work. When all of that was, was, was sorted out, then the state knew who they had to consult with. Now, some of the issues around that is just that, you know, I, I, I'm coming, you know, I'm looking at your heading here at adhesive or dividing wedge. I think next to native title should have been, and, and you had no idea about that process, but it should be native title and land tenure. Is it adhesive or a dividing wedge? Because the two have to run or, or simultaneously work together. The reason why a lot of our, our uh, land tenure was successful in Cape York and in the Torres Straits is because most of that was deed of grant and trust communities, dogged communities. Now, we as a Wutati Corporation, and I can't speak for the corporation or the people, but I'm speaking from experience, we were able to get exclusive native title. Why? Because... Uh, the area that, in, in, that, that was determined is in Shelburne Bay. And um, it had a former mining lease on it and that had been uh, you know, extinguished. Uh, it was an area in another part of a, a neighboring uh, uh, corporation that we're part of, which is Bromley. We identified that there was shared land. So the Wutati Aboriginal Corporation and the Bromley corporation were, were also two late state land dealing processes that were working together because of that shared country. So uh, the Wutati Aboriginal Corporation, we were able to, to be given exclusive native title rights. I remember when you spoke to me about coming on the show, you, uh, you gave an example of an experience um, in one of our, our communities 
where someone wanted to do some economic development activities but could not do it because of the native title issues. One of the things about native title is, is that it, it gives the Indigenous people the right to negotiate and to form Indigenous land use agreements with anyone wanting to come in to do economic development. However, it can be a costly activity. And I, and, and I remember you sharing that um, you know, something didn't transpire because of the native title claimant group or that native title issue. I think once people understand the two processes, they can understand how they can actually negotiate. See, when, when people are wanting to do in, uh, any development building on, on, on country, where there is a native the title determination, you also have to enter into an Indigenous land use agreement, not only with your Indigenous community, but you may need to enter into something <laughs> that involves the local government association. Now, I'll give you an idea. Um, Cook Shire basically is in charge of, of two thirds of Cape York right up to the JD in his freehold land. And that's all under the local government association of Cookshire. When we were given our determination for Wutti, we had to enter into indigenous land use agreements with the Cookshire for them to come and have access to our esplanades, have access to waterways, whatever they had to do as a local government association. We had to enter into agreements with them. And the one thing that I really like about Cookshire's transparency is, is that they will actually have listed, I haven't seen it lately, but they will have listed in the past all of the Indigenous land use agreements that they have with the various traditional owner groups for them to still fulfill their part of their local government obligations. Coming back to native title, is it adhesive or dividing? Well, I'll put it to you this way. For the Indigenous people, it, is, it can be adhesive in the sense that it brings people together, but it also causes uh, some division because you will actually now have individuals who are now exerting their native title rights to a particular area, but because of either stolen generation or forced removal, they've lost that connection, but somewhere along their line, they know that they belong there. So it can be adhesive in bringing a community together, but it also can be divisive. One of the things though, I find that where it, it is divisive is, is that you are getting traditional owners to manage native title interests, not according to traditional custom laws and traditions, but we still have to follow a corporate governance structure determined by the federal government. So the corporation makes decisions in a Western structure. So that can be divisive because then you have traditional laws, customary laws and traditions of who can speak for country and who can't speak for country coming in clash with, with the corporate governance process that's been set out by the government. So it can be divisive in that sense. But I think, yeah. I think in, in regards to some of the issues, but is a lot of small developments, like on an individual property or something, someone wants to build, you know, it's pretty hard. Stephen wants to build a dam to hold water for, you know, to get them over that dry spell. And it becomes a, a massive process. A, first you have to have to get the state government to agree to let your whole retain water on your own property in the first place which they're not that keen to do um and then other and you have to deal with that sort of favored uh, then you've got to uh, deal with the native title issue and deal with, with the appropriate body but it doesn't the scope of the project right might only be in the order of maybe a couple of hundred thousand dollars but the cost of you know bringing the traditional landowners to a center um conference and all the other bits and pieces and that and 
outrun the cost of the project. So it's it's not viable. Um, and that's the same thing with even other, say, small scale projects. It's, it's say it's a, got to be a local co cooperative of farmers. You know, then they haven't got a great big pool of money. They're not multi millionaires. They just want to build a facility to help help their crop in the region. But it, it now has to go through this process, and it adds a cost. That sometimes is in excess of the actual development. Now. If you can't find a way to sort of mitigate some of these costings and that, to get basic projects out of the ground for regional areas for regional benefit, it's going to be a problem. I mean, it's no problem for multinationals. You know, a multinational comes in and says, right, we want to build whatever. We want to build this uh, processing plant here because uh, we've got to get minerals and crush it and whatever. Now they've got multi-billion dollars behind and they got to make, they're not going to do it unless they make buckets of money. So there's buckets of money to be able to deal out to, to cater for this process and satisfy the, the traditional owners. But that's not the case in a lot of these smaller projects. Is there no means whereby those sort of small regional projects can get a bit of a Guernsey and not have the high overhead of, of the whole of, of the of what the corporations are doing look i i do know that there are traditional owner groups that are entering into agreements and partnerships with uh, uh with corporations but it comes back to the determination and whether or not it's exclusive or non-exclusive now uh our, our particular determination in Mutati is exclusive, which means that um, we have total total rights and say over uh, over the land. And um, as part of a state land dealing process, we have uh, what they call a Cape York Peninsula uh, Aboriginal you know, Saipel. So it comes back to the, the tenure or the, the native title determination. And some of those individuals that are, are trying to partner maybe with Indigenous communities um, in economic development, you've got to understand Indigenous native title holders don't have much money. And one of the things that they do receive from the government is funds to do the administrative uh, administration support of their, their, their PBCs, their prescribed body corporates. Now, um, it, it's, 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 it's enough to see the administration side of things happening, but they also have to seek their own legal advice once they've been given a determination if they're independent from any, cap, uh, any land council. Now, I'm, I'm only speaking from experience with our corporation where we fought hard and strong at the time for our funds to be given directly to us as a native title rep body. And because of that, we were able to secure office space here in Cairns with uh, two other uh, native title claimant groups and um, those who have had state land dealings also. And we've come together and we've pooled our resources to be in the one building and work together because of shared interest in a particular area. But some native title um, prescribed body corporates aren't in that position. See, the amount of money that they're given, Bill, is, is not in the millions unless they have a national park attached to it. And here in Queensland, unfortunately, Cape York Peninsula has most of the national parks or Aboriginal freehold where national parks have been negotiated as part of that land transfer. So in saying that, the state will give money to assist in managing those national parks. And it'll be done over a, a, a period of time, whether it be three year or five year. But other regions within Queensland are not privileged to that. So as far as economic development and opportunities, it's very hard for native title holders to 
to do something at a large scale. So if they are going to be negotiating large fees for for uh, their involvement, then that's that's their call. I do know that uh, some of the native title holders in Queensland are looking at carbon offsetting and it is a way for them to generate income. See, once native title is given, that's fine. It gives us rights to hunt and gather and, and uh, recognizing places of significance. But the land tenure process also gives, an, uh, gives further strength to economic development because the traditional owners have that piece of paper that say, hey, we, are, we, we, we hold the deeds to this place and it gives strength to further negotiations with corporations. I do know that um, the land tenure process has been um, love or hated in Cape York. It, it, it's worked. There are some people that aren't happy with it. There are some that are. Um, so other regions have had um, native title holders recognized in a particular area and no development can be done without their involvement too especially if they've had sites of significance registered with the, the Queensland Heritage, um, under, the Queens, uh, under the Heritage Act. So in saying that, the Queensland government is always looking at the high end of business. We know when Anna Bly set up the, um, uh, you know, the business arm of, of, of uh, the Queensland government that looked at all the number crunching of infrastructure development, anyone that's wanting anything done here has to basically wait in line because the state will do all of their number crunching and their business um, business arm will look at the, you know, the dollars and cents as to whether or not something will happen. And they'll say, look, now we'll go and lobby with the federal government. The unfortunate thing is, is that it's looking at the development of the Southeast region. Whereas in far North Queensland and, and uh, other remote areas, they're struggling to meet some of those commitments in, in private enterprise because they don't have any other dollars to work with. I you think know. one of the biggest problems is uh, with the Southeast and regional, regional Australia in general is the only, only place with the potential to grow the pie, to grow wealth. You can't grow wealth by digging a tunnel under the Brisbane River. You can spend $12 billion on it, but it won't generate any wealth. It actually is an ongoing liability because tunnels aren't cheap to operate. You might send trains through there with passengers on. Every one of those passengers for every journey they're taking are subsidized, subsidized by the taxpayer to the tune 11 of $11. So it's not gonna create wealth, a multi-billion dollar project there. But a multi-billion dollar project in regional Queensland, whether it's to open up an economic corridor or get some irrigation project up or some uh, metal processing or whatever, it's going to grow the pie. And to me, it's, it's a simple problem. Basically, we've got a government, both in Canberra and the Southeast, uh, that haven't got the right mix in regards to how we go to grow the pie to erase debt and, and service things like education, health, and the rest of the things we're responsible for. Hmm. But just before we go on, I'd just like to show the audience uh, a couple of maps, if I could. Yep. Uh, we'll just touch on um, basically the areas of Indigenous uh, tribal areas through, scattered throughout Australia. So people can have a, a visual representation of what we're dealing with here and the scope hmm. we're likely to be dealing. Uh, a little bit about your own area up in the Torres Straits and then just, just the map of Queensland in, and its current native total. So I'll just go, th go through them quickly with you. Mm -hmm. Which one? We'll just start on the native title one for Queensland. Mm -hmm. um, 
it's a it's a large map. I couldn't actually reduce it any further. Um, if we just stick to the Cape itself at the moment, um, how many roughly how many land titles, uh, native title areas are in there? If you if you have a look at it, all of the grey areas are your native title claims. So if we're looking at Cape York there in the top end, right up to the tip. And if you ha have a look at on the, the right-hand side of Cape York, that large area in white, that is all freehold, freehold under Cookshire. So all of the gray area is native title determinations, okay? But if you have a look at that, in comparison to freehold, freehold, that is under the Cookshire uh, responsibility, um, there's still a large portion of Cape York that is not under native title. That's freehold, freehold. So the grey areas are native title claims or determinations that have been successful. Okay. Of the lighter area, would there yeah. be, has there been a disconnection of people from that land over time that it's a bit more difficult to make claim? There is there is a community group right in the middle of all of that, and then and, and I've travelled up Cape quite a bit with with uh, native title and land tenure business. Cohen is right smack bang in the middle of that, and uh, yeah, yeah. No, and a lot of people do not realise that Cape York Peninsula is very very wealthy in natural resources. Now, right down the guts of Cookshire, from the bottom there right up to the Jardine River. Along that great dividing range down to Cowan, the biggest gold deposit belt is around Cowan and around Cooktown. And all of that is under freehold and managed, basically it's under local government association of Cookshire. That's freehold, freehold. That's not Aboriginal freehold, that's freehold, freehold. The traditional owners of Cowan uh, my understanding is, is that they're the only ones that have not been able to get native title for that particular area because it's under freehold, freehold. Now, there was a one claim for all of Cape York, and that was spearheaded by the Cape York Land Council. And, and because I've been out of the loop on that progress or that process so far, I, I don't know where that particular claim has gone. But in saying that, um some of those areas gray areas and i don't i can't talk for others i don't know what state land tenure process at a state level they've gone through but wootati and bromley we've gone through our state state land tenure process and all of that land that came under our native title federal process we we had that land transferred to us under um a state process which meant that we have, I think, um, a national park that is under our care and it's joint management with Queensland National Park and Wildlife. Yes. But we also have our own Aboriginal freehold land where if we were wanting to do any economic development on that, we, we can if we choose to. But uh, Cape York, yeah. Hmm. In, in the 30 years that have gone by, and yeah. obviously you've explained that there's two, two well, for Queensland, there's two different processes running in parallel. Mm. What What's the first group or how long ago did the first group achieve both native title and land tenure? Is it, is it five years, 10 years ago or, or further back? Um, um, for us, it took us over 20 years. I, I first... Wutu T1, which was registered way back in 85, 86, that was struck out and then we had Wutu T2. But you could say the process of native title, a federal process, began around 1985, 86. And the whole process of Wutu T2, inclusive of, of all of the hard work that our elders did from way back then and 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 our key, some of our key elders had passed on by the time the determination was given in 2015, I think it is, 2015. So when you look at the time frame, it's 20 plus years. 
If you go back to the, the state, Queensland state map again, and if you can zoom into uh, a couple of those areas, I just want to explain something. If you can zoom right in until you see some numbers that starts with a Q. Mm -hmm. This is this is this is just educating your viewers on how to read a native title map. If you can zoom right into this where the where the um, the blue is, maybe the blue. You see coming down here. Yeah, this, yeah, the blue. Just this one here. If you can zoom into that one. I, I just need to explain some of the numbers that you will see on a native title map. You gotta understand though. There's a Commonwealth Native Title Act, but the Queensland also has a uh, has its Native Title Act. So well, you, these numbers here. Yeah, these numbers here. If you can zoom in a bit more, if you can see, it's um, maybe not clear. It'll actually have. Oops. No, it'll I'm actually have. That. Yeah, you see where. I it's think that's a, that, that's a, that's as sharp as it's going to be, unfortunately. Yeah. QUD, it would have, it's got number, I think it's got number 723 or whatever it is, and then a forward slash 2017. All right. Yep. That'll actually tell you when that claim, determination claim was, was, was registered. So basically a lot of these things haven't been there that long for people to actually, uh, oh, that came up sharper there. Yeah. Yep. Um, so they haven't had much time really to drive benefit as yet. Although the no. process has been around a long time, the ability to actually derive a benefit is only very you know, short-lived you know, at the moment. So, yeah. um, so is there any examples of um, groups that actually have made some good benefits or is it sort of still work in progress? It, it, it's still in progress. I mean, we've got here in Queensland, um, I think four, four land councils that assist native title, um, native title prescribed body corporates. Now I'll, I'll list them and then I can actually send some links to you on this one, but uh, for, for our group and others within Cape York, it's the Cape York Land Council and native title rep body. We have the Carpentaria um, land Council, we have the North Queensland Land Council, and their office is located here in Cairns. And um, the area that you spoke to me about uh, with regards to Croydon, mm. that comes under the North Queensland Land Council. So there are different registered native title rep bodies that at the time when these determinations were put in, they, would they were funded by the federal government to provide lawyers and any other uh, 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 experts to assist in that determination, barristers, you name it, because the legal team had to be funded uh, by a federal government process in order to assist native title holders in court, uh, in the court determination. Basically, they had their, we had our own barristers. So... Someone like uh, uh, the Cookshire had their own barrister. Someone who was a respondent to our claim had their own barrister. Yeah, so, so we know who made the money out of this. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah and, 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 who got the, and who got the bill? The taxpayer. <laughs> and, we, and we still do. Yeah. Oh, God, nothing to cheer about here. Um, yeah, I'll, well, just, you know, I'll just grab a couple of other shares. Um, I think I've got it now. Uh, this is uh, the Torres Strait. Yeah. Um, overall, there's a lot of water. <laughs> yeah. And if if you knock it down to the land mass, it's it's fairly small. Um, also, does the Torres Strait Islanders have this foothold on mainland Australia as well? Is that counted as Torres Strait or? No, uh, you people? you have. There are two island communities and three Aboriginal communities in Cape York Peninsula. Yep. Now, um, SACIA, if you have a look, it's got S-E-I-S-I-A. Yep. That is a Torres Strait Islander community. Um, on and the mainland? On the mainland. Yep. And uh, 
SACIA was established when Saibo was in, inundated with, uh, with waters many, many years ago, 20 plus years. I think they had their 70th anniversary. I think it was 70, don't, don't quote me on that, but the SACIA community was established and the government at that time had relocated the families from Saibo to the mainland, to NPA, because Saibo was basically in, yeah, yeah. Hence the uh, reason why they had back now. Yeah. Uh, some, uh, there are still families on Saibai itself, and some of them have actually uh, still got strong ties to Saibai, and they do stay in Saisia. Uh, so, the, you know, the, the thing about the relationship be between NPA and the Torres Straits is that we actually have a lot of, lot of intermarriage between the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community. Uh, the other community there that we have um, is, is Bamag itself. You've got New Mapu, New Magico, Ingenu. So Ingenu, New Magico um, are Aboriginal communities. New Mapu is an Aboriginal community. Now, how New Mapu was established was, you know, Queensland government have bad history or a bad past where old Mapu was actually burnt down. And the Aboriginal community residents from there were all shipped on barges to NPA and that's how we got New Mapu. So anyone that knows the history of, of land, basically land being stolen from traditional owners, um, you know, the government didn't, didn't do the right thing. We've had communities destroyed. We've had communities burnt. So Anyway, that's another another podcast. Yeah, yeah, that's but, a different podcast. But yeah. overall, um, I, I was reading an article in, uh, I think it was yesterday's paper, and I think it might have been the Telegraph, actually, Sydney Telegraph, because Warren Mundine, I think he resides in New South Wales. Yeah, he's in New South Wales. And he was Wales. just talking, talking about um, uh, the Torres Straits in regards to there's probably between four and 5,000 people over there, but the layers of governance over those people um and the basically the workload to comply with all that governments is fairly horrendous uh considering you only got a population of of uh, four to five thousand people um mm. do you think there's ever going to be any way to sort of streamline that to get <laughs> get up down to at least a federal state and, and one other party in the, in that that sort of situation look we it, Indigenous affairs bill is like an onion. You pull off one layer, there's another 10, 15 other layers underneath and you'll never get down to the core. The issue that we have is, is that it's a historical thing that uh, the Torres Strait has a significant importance to government. Thursday Island has always been an administration island even before the war. Uh, it was an administration island where uh, Europeans and those who are mixed race, Indigenous, married to 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 those who, who had Asian background were, were given certain rights and privileges. Um, my, my background is such, such a mixed background. It's a fruit salad one where I have Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander, Dutch, Indonesian, Malay. And the Indonesian Malay heritage um, was from my great grandfathers that came across um, that were involved in some of the, the shipping industry and the seafood industry. And they were brought over by businesses to work in the Torres Straits. And uh, my grandfather chose to stay. And uh, so you have intermarriage with, with locals. And at the time they said intermarriage with local natives, um, certain rights and privileges were given. My grandmother, who was Aboriginal Malay, when she married my Dutch Indonesian grandfather, uh, she lost all rights to be even given a, you know, she wasn't even referred to as a, as a citizen. She had no nationality at all. She was an alien until my grandfather had received his citizenship. That's on my mum's side. So coming back to the Torres Straits, it is very, very diverse in culture, but it is also has a strate strategic importance to the government. And that's Thursday even Island, more so now because of uh, the incoming, well, the influence of China through the Pacific and its Belt and Roads um, basically trying to seduce small countries to, into economic uh, relationships with their Belt and Road program. Look, it's, um, it's going to be really hard to, to even 
try and do something in the Torres Strait, to, uh, you know, the Chinese, because of our, our Torres Strait Treaty that was formed between the Australian government and the PNG government in, before independence of PNG in 70, uh, 75. The strategic importance of the Torres Strait is one that it is a it is a international highway uh, between Asia and the Pacific. And I mentioned before we actually went live about the Northeastern Management Shipping Plan, that is an agreement with international uh, with with international government and the Australian government, uh, with various stakeholders involved managing the shipping activities in the Torres Straits. Coming back to the various layers of government that Mr. Mundine had referred to, it's always been that way. You have federal, state, and then you have local government. The two local government associations in the Torres Straits itself, and I'm not including NPA, a Northern Peninsula, Cape York, I'm, I'm talking about the Torres Straits itself. You have the Torres Shire, which is not an indigenous council. It is a mainstream Shire council like Cook Shire like any other shire, like Hewington Shire, like Croydon Shire, any of those shires, the Torres Shire Council is a mainstream shire council and it represents the local government needs of both Black, White and Brindle on Thursday Island. Then you have the Outer Island Council, uh, which is the Torres Strait Island Regional Council that looks after all of the Outer Islands. Now, where the government has really made it hard in the funding side of things is, is that those two local government associations are the only two in North Queensland that cannot get direct funding for their infrastructure dollars from the state. This is where the government has really tied up a lot of the funding and we have local government associations having to receive their infrastructure dollars from a statutory body called the Torres Strait Regional Authority, a Commonwealth statutory body receives public works or infrastructure dollars from the Queensland government, and then it goes to the Shire councils. No one has ever addressed that issue. Every time I've brought this up in the past when I've run as an independent and, and uh, in, in my political aspirations, I've raised this issue and people think I'm from Mars. But you have the government, both federally and state, locking the Torres Straits in such a way that local government associations cannot receive direct funding from state, state development for any of the infrastructure needs. They have well, to go through a Commonwealth statutory body to get their infrastructure need dollars. Go figure. Mm. Well, I'm, I'm sure we've got a lot of convoluted... <laughs> Uh, systems in this country. Um, it's confusing, we developed, Bill. We developed as, as separate colonies for the first 100 years, or 150 years nearly, as separate colonies, so we each doing our own thing. And we got dumped, dumped together. Um, and there was, a, well, of course, the Commonwealth had, had some uh, responsibilities and the states had responsibilities. And they were clear cut when, the, when we had federation. But over time, they've actually intermingled, basically because the Commonwealth basically got now got 90 odd percent of the funding because it took income tax off the states and now now controls 90 percent of the revenues. So it's now got a disproportionate influence on the states in regards to what they can do with it you know, to get this funding. So things like education that were clearly and health that were clearly in the state camp have been corrupted by commonwealth money if you if you know what i mean so yeah. we we do have a bit of a dog's breakfast and that needs to be unscrambled um and i think it can only be unscrambled if we, if we go back to the original intention of the constitution we might have a bit of a chance to redefine what the states and the commonwealth are supposed to be doing uh because i don't believe that the commonwealth is there it, it, it was put there to think, look after things like our, our sovereignty, our defence, um, our biosecurity, our trade and things like that. But when federal uh, candidates are campaigning to get elected on the basis that they're going to deliver a toilet block to the local school uh, boarding ground, I think that completely corrupts 
uh, process because you should be electing federal candidates in regards to how safe they're going to keep the country and how well they're going to make trade relations and things like that, not whether they give you a toilet block in your local body park. Uh, and, and I think that's one of the big problems. And the sports rorts sort of shows how corrupted the system is now in regards to the mix of responsibility or the, the blurring of responsibilities from states to federal. So I, 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 I look at it. Like, just big, big, yeah. un, big uh, omelette to unscramble. Yeah, look, I, I, on that note of federal government and health, uh, I explained this in, in, in such a way to, to another group that wanted to know my thoughts on this. State government looks after the bricks and mortar, hence the reason why last year's, uh, you know, state elections, there was X amount of, you know, copious amounts of dollars going towards the reestablishment of certain, certain uh, hospital facilities here in Cairns. So the state looks after the bricks and mortar, but they rely on the federal government for the dollars for the programs, the health programs. Here in far north Queensland, the majority of our health needs in remote communities are delivered jointly between federal government and state government. So you have a lot of our Indigenous health service providers receiving federal government funds. Meanwhile, it's the state that provides the bricks and mortar in order for people to have, um, you, know, you know, for us to have facilities for people to come in as far as hospitals. So I think when, when people understand how policies developed at a federal level and a state level, everything that we're looking at is, is that unfortunately at a grassroots level, and I'm talking about where the rubber meets the road at a micro in the community, it's our, it's our public that miss out a lot because at a federal and state level where the you know macro and 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 meso reforms are done everything gets lost up there and half of the time you know we're, we're losing all of our program dollars through administration of these funds coming through the state from federal you know so oh how long is a piece of string bill we can yeah. go on for you know well, for think, hours I on this i think that's one of the things the problems is layers you know, it's, it's even in regards to just the public servants and their, their pyramids of, of organisations. A fairly narrow base and very pointy, so you get a lot of executives for very few people working at the base. It's like everything. We need to squash those pyramids so we get more people on the front line and less managers. We, and, and I don't know how we're going to do that because, let's face it, everyone wants to build an empire and then the thing is, if you get more people, what you're doing is getting yourself elevated for, for a better level of more pay. So that's, that's the incentive for these, these sort of structures. But they Look, do need to be squashed yeah. down and, and just more frontline people all the way through. Um, I, I, I'll say this comment because I know that time's, time's getting on. But in, in most of our communities, and I'm talking about local government associations and within uh, not only the mainstream but with Indigenous you'll actually find that they have 13 plus legislations that they have to deal with, which, which is also reflective or in alignment with that of either a, a state legislation and also a federal government legislation. So in when it comes back to native title and people wanting to do business with traditional owners, they have this other layer of legislations that they have to deal with in order for them just to get something done. So I, I, I personally believe half of the time our government sets things up for us to fail. I mean, you know, the two main things. I was just going to say that. Yeah. I mean, yeah. well, what we have, we, we, it's very hard to get projects in regional Australia in general. And, and in northern Queensland, and I'll even say for central Queensland, it's pretty much the same. It's, it's an arduous task to get something off the ground. And, yeah. and if, if native title and native title holders and, and the traditional owners and the people doing it can't work together better to make sure things are more cost effective, especially for four, small scale projects, haven't got a lot of dollars to make sure that they get off the ground 
and, and so that they can deliver a benefit to the local community where it is and hopefully the greater greater indigenous pop population as well. But a lot of these projects may be sort of in small, small, small local areas and the and the actual employment benefits and that are not going to be reside so too far away from wherever that is. It's not going to spread well out, you know, hundreds of miles beyond that sort of thing. So what I'm, what I'm suggesting is can we get to a situation where there can be a better evaluation of projects. So, all right, let's come up with some sort of shortcut, especially with fees and process, to get these smaller projects, you know, up and running sort of thing to, you know, benefit the general regions. And yeah, yes, when it comes to a major project where there's, where there's, where there's a major player with major dollars um, had, and that can deliver, great economic benefits uh, to the wider community because it is such large scale um well then that's a different ke kettle of fish but yeah look um, you're, you're talking about micro businesses and I, I i i agree and this is where instead of trying to um eat the whole pie all at once is just you know let's slice it up in little pieces and let's deal with this little thing here uh, we actually do have traditional owner groups that are looking at micro businesses that are looking at at uh, economic development opportunities at a smaller scale because their funds is very limited as far as them having the capacity to to deal with the legal side of things let alone you know investing large dollars that's why indigenous land use agreements between traditional owners and and uh, and business entities is very important but um, in some areas it works and in some areas it doesn't. And I, I guess think, it goes, yeah. I think it's just a matter of there has to be a, a, flex, a bit of flexibility in everything if you actually go to make things move forward. I mean, if you go over to uh, West Australia, if you go back to, I think it was uh, James Price Point or something where there was supposed to be a large gas, gas hub put in, uh, there was issues with that going back to, I think, 2002 and it eventually got banned in about 2015 and things like that. Mm. So there, there was no winners out of, out of that situation. What we want is, all right, there may, may be no big winners, but everyone wins. And, I think that, and that's what I'm talking about as an adhesive thing to bind people is get some successes even though they're, they're small get them underway and make sure they happen and yes when the when the big, big opportunities come there yeah, make sure everything's done to the nth degree to get the maximization benefit to the, to the greater community yeah I, i've always been a firm believer that um, traditional owners need to be uh, open-minded and, and and i'm not saying that they're not I know that there are groups that are, but uh, open-minded and, and uh, networking with the broader business community on what the economic development opportunities are and working side by side. I know that there are communities throughout Queensland and even in WA and Northern Territory that have done that. Uh, th there's one particular community in Northern Territory where they worked with a farmer and they have a large parcel of land and this farmer wanted to grow watermelons. So they went into an adjoined agreement with him in growing watermelons on their land. So you see that that's a small tactical thing yeah. rather than sort of, well, no, we want to all this thing up front because mm. uh, you're going to derive them. But, but rather than that, it's a partnership. And that's, a, that's, that's adhesive. You know, that's cohesion between people. But it, it's, it's a wedge when you start demanding an upfront big, co big um, impediment to a project. And, and we need to sort of make sure that's, that's not the norm. We want to make sure, especially for the smaller scale projects, that they do get a Guernsey and, it, and it's a benefit. You know, it may, maybe it's not a direct benefit to the traditional owners because they're located maybe 50 or 100 miles from, from that farm or whatever but it still brings a, a benefits to the community to the, the region that's what we've got to do 
especially in regional Australia, is we've got to make sure we, we're doing everything we can to grow the regions, uh, especially we've got to help ourselves because no one down south has got to help us. No one's got to you know, make these things work. It's only us working together is going to make it, make it work. Yeah. Look, t totally agree. And, and um, I think there is... Uh a growing number of communities that are thinking along those lines about working together um, with the non-Indigenous community in economic development, especially trying to break the, um, the welfare cycle and not being so dependent on government grants. And, and I think that's where we're needing to, to look at is how do we become independent uh, of government funds because the more we rely on government funds and certain activities in our communities uh, we're dancing at their tune and meeting their KPIs and we forget really what the need is of the community and we see that in a lot of government programs um, run throughout the state whether it be for Indigenous people or non-Indigenous people so yeah. I think one of the other things is too especially now with COVID and that because people have become more familiar with this this sort of engagement through Zoom or, or other mm. other um, other platforms, a lot of a lot of things can be done basically on the cheap or as a, you know, or cost effective. Um, like if someone wants to do a small scale venture, they can have the, there should be a, a, a setup in regards that they can have an engagement just through a Zoom cast and things and talk things over. Uh, rather than say having to bring a number of people, you know, hundreds of kilometres or more, accommodate them and all that, so it increases the cost. If, you know, if we can use these sorts of tools to get around some of those, those um, costings and and, uh, and money problems that come from you know being small projects off the ground, you know, rather than um, lumbering with with a great upfront cost. Uh, maybe build something into it as a residual or something as a percentage where they get that return. Yeah, look, I, I agree. And in our remote communities, most if not all of our local government associations are, are tech savvy. They they do a lot as far as meetings via Zoom. So, um, you know, if they haven't already done it, I, I, I encourage those in those communities uh, looking and knocking on the doors of local government associations and saying, hey, look, you have the IT, you have the technology, how can you assist us in having these meetings? The problem that we have in our remote communities is uh, when, when, when the electricity is down in the Torres Strait, <laughs> it's down. Forget, you know, forget, uh, forget satellite phones. The only ones that will have satellite phones in the, in the remote islands is the health center and the police. Um, and the council, you can't communicate. So once again, uh, telecommunication is being controlled by whoever, and also uh, other means, other means to to things like water. I mean, you, you mentioned before water. I think one of the biggest issues we have here in the state is that most of our water rights is owned by Sunwater. Go figure, you know. And <laughs> but they're not interested in water. They're not interested in getting storage dams and distribution. No, just, uh, they no. don't intend to do anything other than. <laughs> I mean, you can you can look at the Burdekin Dam. I mean, that that was a proposal to um, when it was first built. There was a stage two already in place. Basically, when when it, when the area grew, there was a uh, plan there that could have an additional one uh, fourteen meter wall put on it and a spillway to hold volumes more. Well, the sun water is only coming up talking about water because of the Townsville situation and talking about it being a two, two metre increase on, on the Burdekin Dam, which is, you know, will stop, will stop you forever putting the 14 metres up to satisfy the Townsville requirement, but on the basis of their theoretical getting a hydrogen hub that needs water to make hydrogen. So, not actually interested in water they're interested in renewable energy component of that water so what people got in mind down in the southeast is completely divorced from what people in the regional 
and especially far north Queensland, have expectations of water and 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 its uh, and its use and, and development for it. So look, I, I that's, totally, that's another yeah. question. That's another that's another podcast again. <laughs> but I, I totally agree. I mean, you know, on that note of water security, I remember having a yarn with uh, with the mayor of of, um, of Douglas Shire last year. You know, his his concern in the area of water was water retention. They have so much coming through the Mitchell and that, but they don't know how to, you know, they don't have the facilities to dam it. Yet you'll have others who are, who have a different need in that area. So, you know, in our community, my, my concern is that we don't have enough politicians caring for, for what the real needs are, uh, you know, water security. Well, the whole area has only got one federal politician. It's basically only got one state politician. Mm. So in a, in, a, in a parliament in Canberra, you've got one member of 150. Exactly. In, in, in the Brisbane parliament, you've got one member of 93. You're not going to get much done. And the, again, and the thing is, as population keeps growing in the southeast at you know, 15, 16, 20 times our rate, we're going to lose politicians as times go by. So representation for regional regional Australia in general, it's not just Queensland, it's New South Wales and Victoria. You just got to lose that representation. And without that representation, you are not going to get things done. Or the things you are going to get done are going to completely depend on the priorities and the whim of the politicians of the southeast Queensland um, far as we, we're concerned. So we do have problems coming, coming through the system. Um, but look, it's, it's gone an, over an hour and that. Oh, I'd just like to thank you for, for your time. Is there any last final comments you want to round off with? Look, I, I, I thank you for, for having these segments, Bill, because it's uh, it, 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 I, hopefully what I've said gives, gives the viewers out there a little bit of understanding on how complicated native title process is. And if there's anything that anyone needs to take away from this, that a native title, yes, grants uh, our Indigenous people the rights to land and acknowledging rights as in traditional rights to, to, to certain practices, hunt and gather, but it's actually the state process that gives us the deeds to the land. And um, it, sometimes it's hard for even those individuals who are wanting to do economic development to do that when... Um, yeah, when they haven't got that full process in place. So yeah, hopefully, hopefully everyone knows now that there's a, there's two there's two little beasts that we're dealing with yeah. when it comes to land tenure. <laughs> well, I, I think what most people hope for is a that basically delivers benefit for the indigenous people to take them away from, like you say, the welfare thing, welfare structure. A, a, an ability and a capacity to grow their own economies and their own, own regions and that and get an economic benefit, social benefit, and also an opportunity for small businesses and big businesses to come to useful agreements that basically enhance the whole region of North, far north Queensland, and I think if we don't don't have that sort of cohesion between us, that he's of process where we're both partners in, in this for the overall benefit, not just of the indigenous community, but the whole community and the wealth of the nation mm -hmm. overall. I think yeah. that's that's what we've got to have, and we don't. And like I say, both in any sort of <laughs> Any sort of agreement where, where something like this has to be negotiated, it has to be in good faith. Yes. And, th and that's what we need. And we, we don't want to see um, a situation where it's an obstructionist thing until um, basically as a, as a high hurdle to get over, um, it should be just a walk up and a handshake situation where you can meet, meet face, face to face and get on with an agreement jumping 10 hurdles and then and getting into a conversation if you know what yeah. I mean. So. I, I, I think a lot of those a lot of those types of business relationships, Bill, comes back to people's relationships in the community. 
uh, how, how are they as far as them and the rest of the community? And uh, if you've got people who've been in the community for a long time and, and uh, people know of their worth and know of their value and there's that traditional and historical connection there, you know, I'm sure there are communities out there that are doing business with our, our Indigenous community and it's working very well and no one knows about it, but it's these little micro businesses that are, that are, that are working without government interfering. And I think there needs to be more of those types of businesses revealed so we can actually see what models of best practices are working out there. Um, as opposed to what the government narrative is shoving in our face and saying, no, 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 it'll never work, it'll never work. I firmly believe that there are businesses out there that are working uh, cooperatively with, within Indigenous and non-Indigenous communities, but we just don't hear of it. No, usually I hear the bad news. Okay, yeah. then, thank, thanks you very much for your time. Um, I'll just sign off now, but if you could just stay on the line. Yeah. If you have enjoyed this show, Please like, share and subscribe to our Facebook and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, we'll be taking a break over the Christmas New Year period and we'll be back probably around about beginning of February again for more episodes of Regional Wrap. Thank you.